Good evening, everyone. You are welcome to you are welcome to today's parents um, roundtable discussion. We have about eighteen people. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, we will start in a few minutes so we can allow some more people to join us. It's very exciting for me because I think this topic is really important, preventing home accidents. Everybody here I'm sure has a child at home and it's important to keep the home safe so that our children are kept safe. And to do this for us, we have Dr. John Wood. I'll tell you more about him when we start. So let's give ourselves maybe two or three mi more minutes so that we can get a few more people joining us. And then we can start. So see you soon. Okay, okay, okay. I think we can start now. Um, so let me introduce Dr. Joan Wood to everybody and then Joan, you can take over from there. So Dr. Joan Wood is a wife, a mother, a pediatrician with a special interest in newborn babies. She's a wonderful and a great advocate for children. And she's a very good friend of mine. My bestie, bestie, bestie. Today, she's going to take us to preventing home accidents. Joan, are you there? I'm here, Marilyn. <laughs> okay. So please take 
the floor. Okay, all um, right. Okay, so thank you very much, Marilyn, for that introduction. And good evening, everybody on this platform. I'm very happy and very honored to be part of this roundtable discussion between parents. And I'm sure there are some pediatricians and caregivers, child caregivers amongst us as well. And indeed, I've been part of this a couple of times and I've learned a lot from this platform that has helped me in my day-to-day -day work, even as a pediatrician and as a mother. So my prayer is that today, even as I also share these um, tidbits about preventing home accidents, we'll all try and glean something from the presentation to help us, whether in our work or even as we care for our children. So um, I would like to ask for permission to stop um, the video and then present with just the audio just to enhance the internet quality. Thank yes, you. Yes, Juan. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so our topic today is on preventing home accidents. And um, as Marilyn said, um, this is a very important topic. Um, we, a lot of us have children or we have nieces and nephews or even grandchildren that we all look after or who live with us in the home. And every now and then mishaps happen and we look back and we wonder if we could have prevented these mishaps that probably ended in maybe minor injuries, sometimes severe injuries. So the whole purpose of this um, presentation is for us to look at the various types of injuries or accidents that can occur at the home and see how we can take steps to prevent them. Please, are my slides moving? Yes, Joan, they are moving. Okay, all right. Okay, so this will be the outline of my presentation. So I'll have an introduction and I'll give some background to um, injuries. And then this, we'll go into specific types of accidents that we have or we can have at home. Then we'll conclude. So I just want to say that Every child is important. Whether you, 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 you are seemingly normal without any problems or you have any disabilities or a challenge here or there, every child really matters. And so based on that, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child states that every child has a right to a safe environment and to protection from injury and violence. Having said that, we also know that there are so many children who are killed or who are disabled every year as a result of injuries that occur at home, injuries which could have been pre prevented. And most of these injuries are coming or resulting from open fires, you know, unprotected stairways and heights from flimsy construction, children are falling down, they are being exposed to chemicals and poisons here and there. And so this UN convention comes to enforce the fact that every child needs to be in a safe environment and needs to be protected from injury and from violence. Accidents are a major cause of injury and even death in children. But when we talk about accident, people actually relate to like road traffic accidents or accidents that occur in the outdoor space. But the place that most people will consider as being safe, that is the home. That is where we have a lot of hazard, hazards, you know, pertaining. So many hazards are hiding in this place that we call a safe haven. And these pose a lot of challenge and become a source of injury to a lot of the children. 
We know that childhood injury from accidents is also a major public health problem and it requires a lot of attention. And it is said that unintentional injuries from home accidents account for almost 90% of these um, childhood injuries from accidents. Now, according to the WHO, every year we have about 83,000 children or 830,000 children dying from home accidents worldwide. And when you calculate that, it comes to about 2,000 deaths in a day. This is a very staggering number, considering the fact that 2,000 children are dying a day from home accidents worldwide. And in the USA, it is said that home accidents are the second only after road traffic accidents. And in the United Kingdom, about 40% of all accidents are said to occur at home. In addition to all this, we know that tens of millions of children are also requiring hospital care for non-fatal injuries. So some of the children may not die from the injuries that they are sustaining at home, but they, they become very ill, they may suffer some disabilities and they need to be hospitalized for a long time with long-term sequelae that parents have to deal with. So what is an accident? So the dictionary definition of an accident is an undesirable or an unfortunate happening that occurs unintentionally and usually results in harm, injury, damage, or loss. So please take note of the words. So it's an unfortunate happening and it occurs unintentionally as opposed to intentionally, you know, injury, damage, or loss. And so today we are focusing on the injury that comes about as a result of home accidents. So an injury is defined as the physical damage that results when a human body is suddenly subjected to energy in amounts that exceed the threshold of physiological tolerance. So there's a very long definition. Okay, so what it means is that the body suffers an amount of energy that is way above what the, um, the, the body can handle. And then that affects the way the body sort of functions. So it may also result in a lack of one or more of the vital elements that you need in your body, such as oxygen. So people are injured and, you know, as a result of the injury, they lack oxygen. Some may bleed and as a result of the bleeding, they will lack oxygen, reduce um, blood in the body, leading to a reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the uh, blood that is left in the body may result in a lack of oxygen. So this energy that we are talking about, it can be mechanical. So it's like somebody can hit you with something or you can fall down. It can, it can be thermal. So it can be because you are exposed to a certain form of heat or it can be from a chemical source or it can be from a radiation source. Okay. But the, as I said, the focus of this, this discussion today is on unintentional injuries. And we'll be talking about accidents that result in such injuries, such as drowning, poisoning, burns, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about them. So who is a child? Again, we are going to use the U UN convention um, definition. So it says that a child means every human being below the age of 18 years, okay? So this is the age group that we are going to talk about. And this age group can be further subdivided into so many other groups, depending on what you want to talk about. So for this particular discussion, we are focusing on the age group, the zero to four year age group. I may mention a few, a few times, I may go into the other age groups, but the focus is mainly on the zero to four year age group. Now, a number of factors contribute to children's susceptibility to injury. And we know that in children, 
they are growing and then they are developing. So in young children, the curiosity and the drive to experiment are not matched by the capacity to understand or respond to danger. You know, as they grow and as they experiment their environment, they want to see everything, they want to touch everything. They want to, you know, they just want to be out there and experience the world. But then also, there lies the danger that they may not actually understand because they do not have the capacity to understand the dangers that lie ahead of them. And such also leads them to experience some injuries. So because of this, children need constant supervision, especially in hazardous environments. And this can be very difficult for a lot of parents because parents are usually doing a lot of things. You are multitasking, you are torn between conflicting rules. There's a child to take care of, you are cooking, or you are helping another child with homework and all of that. So this constant supervision sometimes is lacking, you know, and that can push a child into having an accident that will cause an injury. And so a lot of the time, children are also left in the care of older siblings who themselves are actually also not, you know, do not have the capacity to sense danger or respond appropriately. And so they are no better, they are, they are not better off being with these older children anyway. And a lot of the times we also view children as just small adults, but they are not because their physical and cognitive abilities and activities and risk of behaviors are all changing all the time as they grow. All right. So we know that as children grow, their ability to move um, also increases. So we know that as they develop, by the age of three months, children are wriggling and some are starting to roll. By about six months of age, they will sit up. And by nine months, they are crawling around. And once they have that mobility, they can reach out for objects, grasp objects, and put the objects in their mouth. An 18-month-old is walking. He can move around from one place to the other. He's exploring the world. And so he can get hold of anything that he wants. He can put anything in his mouth. He can chew anything, drink anything that he wants to, OK? So child development and behavior is therefore highly associated with injuries. And poisoning, for example, is linked to the grasping and drinking behavior of children. So between the age group of one to three years, these people can actually take hold of, you know, containers, bottles, cups, and put them to their mouth. And this can result in, you know, poisoning, for example. And then we have the age group of about the same age group who are also walking, you know, and the risk of falling can also be very high in this age group. What about childhood injury by gender? It is said that boys tend to have both more frequent and more severe injuries than girls. And various theories have been proposed for this difference. So it is said that boys and to girls, they also have a lot of tend to behave more impulsively as compared to girls. And these push boys to you know, sustain more injuries as compared to girls. So it's also been suggested that boys have been socialized or are socialized in different ways as compared to girls. So as parents, sometimes we are sort of a bit overprotective about our young girls, our, our, our daughters. You know, we, when we watch the children play, sometimes it's okay for the boy child to fall, but then let the girl child fall and everybody's like, oh, sorry, sorry, you know, that kind of, so sometimes the way we socialize these children, you know, makes them more prone to, to, to developing childhood injuries. And then, um, yes, so that's it. What about the other physical characteristics that make of infants, for example, will burn more deeply and quickly of adults? 
infants also have smaller airway sizes as you know sizes as compared to adults and so because of that they are at increased risk of aspiration and then um when we look at their body you know surface area to volume of every person children are smaller so they they have a larger ratio of body surface area to volume and this has implications for the kind of injuries that they sustain especially when it comes to burns and poisons so little amounts of um poisons for example that may not harm adults much may actually cause a lot of harm to a little child or an infant just because of this dynamic of a larger ratio of a body surface area to um, volume So what are the accidents that cause injury in children to the ch children under five actually fall on so like talking transmission and seasoning. We have burns and skulls, and then we have drowning. So we'll take them one after the other. So this picture, as you see in here, shows a child who is probably in a swimming pool. And just by looking at his face, you can tell that he's in this John. His body language John. doesn't look like somebody who is Hello. Hello. fun. Hello, Joan. How are you? This is like a child oh. who is drowning. Hello, yes. John. I think the network for the last one minute or so we couldn't hear you properly. Hello, Marilyn. Yes, yes. I'm saying for the last one minute, I think the network is um making your sound break. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Oh. Hello. Hello. Oh, I think uh, Dr. John is off. Ah, okay. Let me call her. Let me call her. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Okay, so I was um, talking about drowning. So I was talking about the fact that this um, it shows a picture of a child who is drowning. So we all know how water is very important in every child's life. They drink or we all drink water. We all use water to have our and play in water. Unfortunately, even though water is so enjoyable for everyone, especially the children, it can also be shown that children do not actually need a whole big pool of water before they can drown. They can actually drown in a few centimeters of water. So even water that is sitting at the bottom of a bucket or in a bath is actually enough to cause a child to drown. And in most countries around the world, drowning ranks amongst the top three causes of death from unintentional injury, with the highest rates being amongst children under five years. So when we talk about drowning, what are we, uh, what is drowning? So it is an event in which a child's airway is immersed in a liquid medium leading to difficulty in breathing. So this event in itself may result in death of the person, or in this case, the child, or the child may survive. But even when they survive, this child at risk of having, you know, developing long-term con um, consequences and disability. So they may be left with permanent um, disability just because they drowned. So what are the risk factors? So again, age, we've talked about age, age and development here is also very key. Children under five years of age, you know, appear to have the highest drowning. Children, actually, a lot, a lot of children under five years die from drowning throughout the world. You know. And this is really related to the developmental stage of the child. So unintentional drowning at this stage is mostly because the result is mostly as a result of a child being left alone or with an unqualified caregiver, such as a younger or a, an older sibling in or near water, okay? So, Young mobile children may often wander away from a supervising adult and fall into a nearby water body, like a pool, you know, and often this caregiver or parent is not even aware that the child has wandered away and has, you know, fallen into the water body. So based on the global data, the risks of fatal drowning are higher in males than in females. We've talked about how the males and risky behaviors that can make them more prone to these injuries. But there are also other underlying conditions like epilepsy and then um, autism, ch uh, children with um, heart problems, with cardiac arrhythmias. They can suddenly have like a cardiac arrest and all of that who are also very prone to drowning. Now, what about um, the other risk factors? So we have lack of safety equipment, whether they are un un unavailable or inaccessible, they are not there. And so they do not help the child to be safe in the water. You know, and sometimes some of these safety equipment, we think that they, they are in the best of shapes or they are they've met the requirements for safety and maybe some of them do not. And so we put all our hopes in them. And sometimes parents are said to have a false sense of feeling that their children have this safety equipment on them and they are in the water. So children are in the swimming pool, for example, and then they have the water wings or the floaters. And parents have that false sense of assurance that the ch children are safe in the water. It may actually leave them in the pool and go elsewhere to go and you know do their own thing so when and where are the children drowning so in low income or middle income countries just as ours most drowning actually happens during our daily activities so during play during work when we are washing collecting water when we are bathing that's when most of the children drown in contrast to high income countries, most of the children 
actually drown during recreational periods. So children who have gone to the swimming pool to swim or to the river side with maybe um, a grandfather to fish, for example, may fall into these water at home. So in general, most children drown in and around the home. So the baths are very common location. So we fill the bath tubs, maybe halfway, the children are sitting in, a child sits in and is beating the water. He's having fun. We are enjoying the fact that the child is also happy in the water. And that's, you know, maybe the beginning, that, that may be what is all that is needed for that child to drown in the water. So these children should never be left unattended. So the children are sitting in a bath and having the fun, but they should be someone there supervising whatever is going on. And then for young children in high income countries, the presence of a residential pool. So these days, we God has blessed a lot of us. So we may have a home where you have a swimming pool, but if the pool is not properly fenced off, you know, that is one of the strongest exposure factors. You may have a child just wandering off and then, you know, falling into the um, swimming pool. We have um, boreholes and wells in our homes as well. And these may also be unprotected and children may inadvertently fall into them. So how do we prevent drowning? We have to eliminate the hazard where it is possible. So this is the most effective prevention met method. So if you know that a child can drown in a bathtub or a, a, a bucket of water, then don't fill the bucket of water at all. Keep it empty so that the child will not drown in it, okay? And in our environment, we have several building, you know, projects going on. Some people may be living in homes where um, we have uncom uncompleted homes. So uh, you are living there, but there, there are one or two trenches around the home filled with water and the children may fall into them. So fill these trenches to prevent water from collecting into them and serving as a trap for these children. We need to cover the wells and then and fence off the, full, uh, the swimming pool and then also use the personal flotation devices as and when they are needed. The laws <clears throat> must also be enforced. So in many high income countries, um, there's le legislation that requires that pools should be fenced off, even including the ones in our homes. And if these are rig rigorously followed, the, for, the, the laws are enforced, I believe that it will go a long way to prevent drowning. Then supervision by parents or caregivers, we cannot overemphasize that. We often underestimate the risk of drowning and we are most of the time, we are not even aware that the child is at risk. You know, so parents and caregivers need to understand that young children should never be left alone or even left with another young child, you know, as someone to take care of this other younger one. And so the supervision needs to be there. And then we all need to learn basic life saving um, skills. A BLS, if you go out there, a lot of, you know, in high income countries, and indeed, I think now a lot of people are learning how to we sustain, give first aid and all that. And we should all be able to, we should learn it so that we can use it when we have to. Okay. So drowning injuries will arise because a person cannot adequately breathe or obtain oxygen. So sometimes even if you are able to retrieve a person who has drowned, they may have stopped breathing for a while. And because of the lack of oxygen to the brain, they may suffer some brain damage. So as I said, as a requirement for all of us, we need to actively look for and train us. So we finished with um, drowning and then we'll move on to burns. As you can see in the picture, we have a child who held on to something that was hot. And then we have this little girl standing in her mother's kitchen and pulling the handle 
of a pot. So you can just imagine if that pot or that saucepan has a hot liquid in it, in it this child is going to suffer um, severe burns to her face, to her hands, and that will end um, with serious consequences. So a burn is defined as an injury to the skin or other organic tissue caused by thermal tra trauma. So that's heat. So it occurs when some or all of the cells in the skin or other tissues are destroyed by hot liquids. So then you end up having scalds or hot solids, which co will cause contact burns, or you have flames, which can actually burn the child. So we call them flame burns. So overall, they said children are at risk of for death from burns with a global rate of about 3.9 deaths per 100,000 population. And infants have the highest rate of death from, from burns. So this rate will actually decline with age, but increase, increases again in the elderly population. So younger children, more younger children die from burns, um, same as for elderly adults. In between, the rate decreases. The long-term consequences and the disability that can result from burns will place a considerable strain on the individual themselves and their families, as well as on the healthcare facilities. So according to WHO data, approximately 10% of all unintentional injury deaths are due to fire-related deaths. Again, age plays a very important role here. So burns in very young children often occur from a mixture of curiosity and then awkward makes them go out and touch and then that will end in a bend. In children under the age of four years, the level of motor development does not match the child's cognitive and intellectual development, and injuries can therefore occur more easily. So they, they, they don't have that ability to recognize that what I'm doing will end up um, with me sustaining injuries. So I should withhold back. I, should, I, should, I shouldn't go ahead and do that. Okay, infants under the age of one year are in particular, they are in a particular cat category. As, so as their mobility starts to develop and they reach out to touch objects, they put themselves you know, at risk. And because they are touching, they suffer more burns to the palms and the hands, you know, more than, you know, more than injuries to the rest of their bodies. Okay, but again, it depends on the, so the source of the heat. So if it is water that they go and touch and then it pours, obviously it may pour on their hands and then pour also on their body. But because the child has a thinner skin on the palms and is not able to withdraw as fast from a source of heat as an adult would, the exposure time is longer and so they sustain more deeper bends as compared to an adult who would put himself in the same situation. So what are the types of burn injuries? So we have the skulls, which are the most frequent types among children under the age of six years. And typically the skull, skull burns okay when a child pulls down a container of hot fluid, such as a cup of coffee or Milo in our situation. And then this pours onto their face, upper extremities and then trunk. So these injuries thankfully are super, usually superficial second degree burns and they tend to heal quickly. But as the children grow older, they become less likely to be injured by the common household objects and become more interested in the outside world. And so you have older children who may not suffer from the scalps, um, the hot water injuries as the younger one. As the younger ones would. Okay. <clears throat> so by gender, again, boys, boys 
but however, it is said that in some areas of the world, burns are actually one of the fatal injuries that occurs more frequently among girls than boys. We, that, we know that in some areas, girls, are, um, they are more exposed to fires as compared to the boys. Okay. Some children are also more vulnerable to burns than others. So you have the disabled children, children with uncontrolled epilepsy. And then unsafe equipment. So if you have um, a heat source that is on the ground, again, in a lot of our homes, we may use the coal pot or a stove outside in the compound of the house. So it's on the ground, you have your pot on it, soup is cooking just about two months ago actually i lost a nephew from that the mother was cooking outside preparing her palm nut soup as she turned to go inside and you know came back she she was inside when she heard people screaming and when she came this boy two year old had put his arm into the soup and the pot had actually turned on him and he suffered some burns and unfortunately he died from his wounds okay so these are, are very things that we do every day, but they pose a lot of danger for the children um, that we live with. Then we have the flammable substances like kerosene. So we store them in the house. They may catch fire. Apart from the fact that they may catch fire, kerosene in particular also can act as a poison for children, which we'll talk about um, later. And then we have the fireworks. So every Christmas and New Year, we hear the fireworks going off. Children are buying crackers. You see a group of boys, you know, playing with the crackers and setting them off. And they are prone to injuries from these. Okay. What are the other human factors? So we've talked a lot about the environmental factors and all that, but living um leaving children unattended to in the bathroom is another thing that we sometimes do so children are in the bathroom you you have poured the hot water into the bucket and probably you just turned around you want to come and add some cold water before you realize they've put their hand in the bucket and all these make um children prone to injuries from um, the hot liquids, putting hot drinks at the edge of the table or on table cloths. So they reach out one to three year old, he's walking, he just walks to the dining table and holds the cup of coffee or Milo and then it just pours onto himself. Or they pull the table cloth and then it comes along with the container that has the hot liquid and it pours on them. So all these are human factors that we can avoid pan handles taken out in front of the stove. So we saw in the picture, the girl holding or pulling on the pan handle. And we can all imagine what can happen from that. So what, at what time do these accidents typically happen? So it is said that the accidents happen usually um, during the two peak times of the day. So in the morning and then in the evening. In the morning when everybody is rushing, to go out to work and to school, people are paying less attention. Um, caregivers, parents are you know, involved in so many things at once. And may not be focused on the child. So the child can get hurt at that time. And then in the evening, when everybody gets back home. Mommy is cooking. Daddy probably is not yet at home, and all that is something that the child can also um, be produced. Okay. A religious um, festival, um, putting them off the ground so into.
I'm sorry, we are trying to get Joanne back. Oh. You went off again, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah, back now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Please, are the flights moving? Yes, they are mo moving. We are on first aid for burns now. John, did you hear me? Hey, my, not, my, my slides are not moving. Uh, hello. Yes, I did, hello, but my slides are not moving. Hello, Doc. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we can try again. We can. Hello, uh, Marilyn. Stop, we can stop sharing and reset. Hello. Yes, Joan. Joan. Okay. All right. Uh huh. You can okay, stop sharing. So should... Yeah, and we share. Yes. Stop sharing and we share. Okay. Yes, uh -huh. I am. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So I think I was on interventions for preventing burns. I'm so sorry about the internet. So um, in what are some of the interventions to prevent burns. So the temperature of the hot water that are taps, um, it is advised that you always check the temperature of the hot water before you even um, pour it on the child. So you can do that by putting your elbow in the water. If it burns your elbow, that is too hot. So it should be just comfortable. And then you can um, use that to bath your child. Um, using child resistant lighters is also um, has also been recommended and then banning fireworks or fireworks is being banned in a lot of um, high income countries but unfortunately in Ghana I thought there was a ban in place at a time but it doesn't look like it because every Christmas and New Year, we hear the fireworks going off in the neighborhoods. Okay, so what about the educational approaches? So like what we are doing right now, sharing knowledge amongst ourselves, this can also be done at school as well to let the children know about the dangers of burns. You know, it's been shown to help prevent um, unnecessary burns in children. And then it's good supervision so the community programs that help ensure good supervision of children, especially for children with disabilities, and then education of um, parents. We not do. Okay. So, so for you to be able to help someone, you should have an electrical, you know, current, then you switch it off. If the child has sustained that, so that you can protect yourself to help the child. And then Okay. 
Hello. Hi, you're back? Yes, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering whether, um, um, Godfrey, do you think she just talking without sharing will make a difference? And then we share the slides to everybody later. I don't know if that will make a difference with the internet. Should I just go on for now? Okay, let, me, uh, let me go on. Okay. okay. All right. So we do not apply things to the surface, to the affected surface. You don't apply eyes. Don't open the blisters up with a needle or pin. I've seen that a couple of times. And then you do not apply any material directly to the wound as it may make it, you know, it may make it be like it can become infected. Okay. And then you avoid the application of anything at all until the child has received the appropriate medical care. Uh, no. The slide is not moving. Okay. Okay, what to do? So in the event that um, a child has suffered a burn, you stop the burning process by removing the clothing and then irrigating the wounds. So you can apply some cold water to allow the burnt area to remain intact under the cold water for some time. And this will reduce the heat. Uh, you know, it will, it will sort of cut short the process, the uh, the process that is going on from the heat that has um, come into contact with the skin or the cells. And then in flame injuries, you, help, you, you have to allow the patient to roll on the ground or you may use water, depending on what it is to um, douse the flames. And then in chemical burns, you remove or dilute the chemical agent by irrigating the wound with water, and then you obtain um, medical care. All right. So we, we are done with the burns, and let's look at the falls. Now falling, Falling is actually said to be a part, is a normal part of the way the child um, develops. They are learning to walk, they are learning to climb, they may fall, they are running, they are jumping, exploring their physical environment. And, you know, it's said to be a normal part of the child's development. Fortunately, most of the falls that children suffer, you know, they don't really result in a lot of injury. They may suffer some minor bruises here and there, a few cuts. But when a fall, the, the, the energy from a fall goes beyond what the body can absorb, then the, 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 it will result in an injury. So this is a picture of a boy who has fallen down a staircase. Okay, so what is the definition of a fall? So according to the WHO, falls are an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground. So you are standing, then you are the next moment you are on the ground or on the floor, or you are resting, you, 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 are, you are at a certain level and before you realize you are at a lower level. So that is a fall. What are the factors relating to falls? So the main factors that relate to fall in children are the age, again, the gender, the physical development of the child, what they were doing before the fall. So were they running, were they walking, were they climbing, the location of the fall. So the height from which the fall fell, uh, the, the fall occurred. So the child did the child take his all the way to the bottom or he was just standing on the floor and then he fell down. And then what are the characteristics of the surfaces on which he landed? So was is the floor smooth? Is it soft? Does it have sharp objects projecting? All these things will affect the injury that the child will eventually sustain, the kind of injury that he will eventually sustain. So in terms of the age, again, we've talked about infants 
who are learning to climb the staircase and all that. So um, once the physical opportunity is presented to them and you know, there's no supervision or lack of supervision, for example, they are learning how to walk and climb. So it's there and they will go. That is just them. It's an infant. It's the stage of development. And then we have um, um, the curiosity of children. Again, they want to explore. And so they will just go. They, don't, they are not watching the floor. Something is on the way. They bump into it. And then they are down, you know. But for older children, they may have access to a wider range of territory. And so they may go out of, you know, not just the usual walking around. They may actually go out and try things, you know, that will make them fall, you know. So, so it's, they, they engage in daring acts and that can make them fall. So where do the falls occur? In most high income countries, it's said that um, all these car seats and the um, height, um, that, uh, the, the table chairs that we are using for them, the baby walkers, all these things falling from the staircase um, make in, the children prone to falling. And then for the older children, they may go out outside, maybe to the swing and then, you know, swing and then fall down and hurt them. In the low income countries, well, we, we do not have a lot of documentation, but when we take populations like Brazil and the Venezuela and the Cubes, again, a lot of the children are falling at home and they are also falling down from staircases, just as the children in the high income countries. And then again, children are falling down from bed. So the bank beds or beds that do not have protective railings. Children are falling down from them, them and then getting hurt as well. And in terms of gender, males will still outnumber the females, and we know the reason why. The kind of products that we are using for the children, so I talk about the strollers, the prams, the baby walkers, the high chairs, the changing tables. We have a false sense of security when our children are in these, and they may topple over or the brakes may fail. Somebody may give them a gentle push and the children may fall. The physical environment, lack of building maintenance. So a house with a, maybe a broken staircase has to be repaired, but then um, the maintenance culture is not there and children may trip. Okay. All right. So what are some of the interventions that we can put in place to prevent um, falls in children? Now, whatever interventions that nice, we must recognize the fact that children are growing and they also need to develop. So whatever interventions we put in place must allow them to play and explore 
and be physically active. But at the same time, we should recognize that they are vulnerable. And so we must make whatever environment that they are in safe for them. And um, even as they, they so we have to identify and replace unsafe products. Um, so I hear that the baby workers initial, um, originally had braking systems that did not, you know, um, made it more prone for babies to fall, to fall, to fall down. So there was a new braking mechanism that was introduced for the baby workers, for example. So uh, the fact that they were falling out of the baby walker led them to modify the original design for the baby walker. Okay. So what are some of the other things that we do? We can do. So for example, for the staircase, we can fit a safety gate at the top and the bottom of the staircase so that it will be difficult for a child to be able to open up that gate and either climb up or climb down the stairs. And then the staircases should always be free of hazards so that children do not trip on them and fall. And then we should maintain the staircases, replace the worn out carpet, replace tiles that have been removed and all that. And then the balustrades, another very common source of injury for the young ones because they tend to climb them. They should, make, they should be made strong climbing. And the stairs should be well lit so that the children can see. And then we should fit resistant window restrictors. So a lot of our homes have the window, um, the burglar proofing. Yes, and these are good for preventing children from falling out of the windows. Sliding windows that we tend to have deep in. A child can actually put a chair under the window and then climb out of it. Make it easy for him to get access to the window. Take that chair away from the window so that he cannot climb the window. So falls are very common in many countries, and it um, causes a lot of children to visit the emergency room injuries. They can die from these injuries that they sustain. And when God has been so gracious and they do not die, some of them um, may actually sustain long-term um, disability, making it very difficult for the child himself and for his parents. We'll talk about poisoning. And here we see a lot of the household agents that we use. We see a child pouring down a number of tablets on the table. I, but the home and its surroundings can be a dangerous place for children, particularly for the possibility of unintentional poisoning. So again, their curiosity comes to play here, exploring around the home um, you know and that leads them to find things that they are not they are not supposed to be touching so as a result millions of children go to the you know emergency room or a lot of calls are made to the poison control centers just because a child has ingested something that they shouldn't have ingested so poisoning refers to an injury that results from being exposed to an exogenous substance that causes cellular injury or death. Okay, so the person has to actually take it, you know, or the person's body has to come into contact with the substance. And then the poisoning, okay, so poisons can be inhaled, they can be ingested, they can actually be injected or absorbed into the skin. It's also said that poisoning may also occur in utero. So you have an unborn baby, you are pregnant, and you are exposed to maybe certain poisons little by little, goes into your blood. The child or the fetus in your uterus may be exposed to the poison as well. And poison may be acute or chronic. So acute, there and then the 
child swallows something and then the manifestation is seen. But you can also have all these little exposures over a long period of time. And then um, eventually you may start exhibiting symptoms that you've been poisoned. The factors determining the severity of poisoning and its outcome in a child are interrelated. So you, what are they? So the type of poison, for example, some, yes, even though it's a poison, may not be, fate, it may not lead to fatal outcomes. Um, yes, you may have some harm and some dis disabilities, but the child, for example, may not die. The dose is also important in determining the severity of the poisoning. So you, 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 in some poisons, you, all you need is just a little amount of it and then the child can die. But some, you, the child may need to have swallowed volumes of, this, of, of that particular poison before um, a problem arises. The formulation is also important. So is it a liquid versus is it a solid? Liquids are said to be um, absorbed very quickly as opposed to solids, which have to dissolve before the body is able to absorb it. The route of exposure is also important. The age of the child, the state of nutrition of the child, all these things have a, a, a bearing on how severe the poisoning will be in the child. So the time interval between the exposure to the poison and the appearance of clinical symptoms is an important um, window of opportunity. So if you are able to catch the person early, for example, you may be able to avert the overt expression of all the um, manifestations of the poisoning. And um, during this time, it is important that when you get to the person, as soon as they have sort of maybe ingested a poison, you sort of um, you try to, there are things used to neutralize or remove these um, poisons. But I'll talk a bit about this when we go further down. But in general, if poisons are ingested in solid doses, um, as I said, the onset of action is slower because it has to be dissolved as opposed to liquids, which will be readily absorbed. Okay, acute poisoning accounts for about 45,000 deaths annually in children and young people under the age of 20 years. So children under the age of one have the highest rates of fatal poisoning, particularly those in low and middle income countries. And um, generally to the children, and the infants are the ones who suffer the greatest mortality or die more from poisoning as opposed to older children. And boys have a higher rate than girls as usual. Okay, so although the poisoning death rates are highest in children who are under 12 years of age, the, the incidence of poisoning cases um, um, as reflected in the calls to the poison control centers and emergency and departments is generally higher in the other groups. So children, a lot more children under the 12 years of age will die or die from poisoning as compared to the other age groups, even though there are more children in the other or older age groups who are exposed to poisoning. So non-fatal poisoning, in fact, appears to be more common amongst children aged one to four. So the children aged one to four tend to have poisoning that may usually not result in a, the death of the child. So what are the types of poisoning? Okay, um, usually medicine sold over the counter, such as paracetamol, the cough and cold syrups that we have at home, iron tablets, antihistamines, so medications such as the antidepressants that a, grand, a grandfather or a grandmother may be taking at home. The household products such as the bleach, the disinfectants, 
detergents, even cosmetics. Children are known to dip their hands into, um, um, what is it called, the permine creams and all that, and eat. We have pesticides, including the insecticides and all the rest of them. And we have even poisonous plants. So at home, all those of us who love the, the plants, again, if you have children at home, you should be careful the kind of plants that you have at home, you know, because some of them may be poisonous. And then the animal or insect bites, so the snakes, snake bites, scorpion bites, all of them can be a source of poison to children. And then one of the most common agents involved in childhood poisoning in low and middle income and Ghana, I can say confidently that kerosene is one of the um, um, common hydrocarbons that the children, so we used to have a lot of them, and I'm sure a lot of the Africans who are listening or on the platform right now can testify to this. Children come in all the time with kerosene injection. So having talked about Hello. Hello. Yes, John, we are here. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Okay. So the the risk factors. Um, I think we've talked about the risk factors. Um, we've talked about them already. Okay. Okay, all right, so the risk factors, we've talked about a lot of the child-related factors. So what are some of the agent factors? So the agent that is causing the, the poisoning, what are some of the factors that makes it more poisonous? So the more concentrated or potent the toxic agent, the greater the risk of severe mortality and then morbidity. So if the poison is more, the, the agent is more poisonous, yes, of course, then the child will suffer a lot more from that. Um, the nature of it, we've talked about the fact that liquids are um, very quickly and more readily as compared to the solids. Okay. And then we know that the liquids, liquid medications are everywhere in any child any home that has children will have some liquid med medications in there and sometimes the children like them so I, i've heard children saying hey, mommy i want to drink the toffee medicine or i want to drink the yogurt medicine so if you have terminologies like this the children see these medications as toffees and yogurts and toffees and yogurts every child likes toffees and yogurts so of course it poses a risk. They are more likely to gulp down all these medications um, as compared to medications that are not um, um, palatable. So the physical appearance of the toxic substance also plays a large part in its attractiveness. So if you have a medication that is in a brown bottle, for example, that doesn't attract the child. Okay, as compared to medications that are brightly colored. So it reminds me of the multivites, the 
um, the, the iron tablets that used to be served at the antenatal clinic um, when we were like in the medical school, I think. Um, they, they actually looked like the Smarties, the chocolates. So of course, children see them and they think that they have chocolates and they are likely to gulp down all these iron medications, which indeed will be poisonous for the child. But the most obvious risk factor for ingestion of the substance is its presence in the environment within the reach of the child. So if the child cannot have access to it, then definitely the child will not drink it. Also, the other problem that we have is we dispense certain um, agents into certain containers. And I'll talk about kerosene again. In this country, kerosene is sold and so stored in mineral bottles, in the Baltic bottles. And children know that we have sweet drinks in these mineral bottles. They know that there's water in Baltic and kerosene looks like water anyway. So if they pick a Baltic bottle that has kerosene in it, they may think it is water and then just gulp it down. So that poses a risk for the child. Okay. And then in some places, tablets are stored in unsealed envelopes. Um, children are drinking for containers that have been used to dispense toxic substances. You have pesticides that are stored in the house that look like pop, uh, flour and have been used to cook food for entire families. You know, so all these things um, uh, um, affect or make it easy for children to access poison. And then we have the medicine and bathroom cabinets, which are said to be the safest storage places safe. So there are no, no areas for storing medications. Okay. Many parents are unaware that young children may indeed be able to access the contents of child resistant packaging. So sometimes we also have that false sense of assurance that the child may not be able to get the medication out of the package of the container. But it is said that about 20% of children will eventually be, open, will be able to open those child resistant package. What that um, child resistant package is doing is delaying the time for the child to be able to open the package so that eventually maybe an adult or somebody who somebody can walk over and see that the child is trying to open the package and then take it away from them. So it doesn't, the fact that you have a child resistant package doesn't take away the place of good supervision. Okay, so what are some of the interventions? We've talked about safer packaging, um, the child resistant packaging, safe storage of poisons in the home um, requires a secure location where the child cannot um, overcome the barriers of, um, the, of, of the locks and then the height. Okay, so the main reason for storing poisons out of reach of children is that this is a delaying strategy. Okay. okay. And then reducing the agents, kerosene in, 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 in a Baltic bottle, for example, you can get a brown gallon and, you know, they are less likely to be drawn to a brown gallon that, um, you know, for them to open it and ingest. Okay. Removing toxic agents from the environment is the most effective way to prevent children coming into contact with poison. Okay. Okay, so how do we manage the child with poisoning. We have to remove the child from the source of exposure and decontaminate the child. Okay. So assess what the age has he taken, when did he take it, and what is his current clinical status. Okay. Then you need to stabilize the child and then decontaminate the child if appropriate. So I've put here palm oil because it's a common practice that's um, 
we 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 practice in this country. So a child has gone down um, um, kerosene, and the first thing that comes to our mind is bit to vomit this palm oil kerosene mixture, the mixture, and that at the end of the day um, worsens the outcome for the child. So um, if you do not know the antidote <clears throat> to decontaminating a child, don't do it. Yours is to get the child very quickly to a place where the child can be helped. And once the child gets there, they will make sure that they provide all the supportive therapy that the child needs. So I've put here just a poison, the, the contact for po the poison control center in Accra. A lot of um, countries have poison control centers. And what they do is they provide some first aid. They may tell you, you need to go to the hospital. So in Accra, we have a poison control center and it's located at the Rich Hospital. So lastly, we'll just talk about choking, suffocation, and strangulation. And um, it's again one of the common um, um, injuries that occur from accidents in, at the home. So again, because of their curiosity and the zeal to explore their environment, children tend to suffer these. Now, babies and toys have small airways that are easily blocked. So in addition to that, their reflexes are not well developed. So they cannot easily strangulation the common hazards around the food or can block the breathing tube. So you know the nuts, the raw carrots or other hard vegetables, popcorn, corn chips, Hello. Yes, John, we are here. We are back. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So some of these foods may end up um, being a choking hazard for the children. The slide is not moving. Okay. All right. So how do you prevent choking on food? So you ensure that the young children are sitting quietly whilst they are eating or drinking, they are not fidgeting. And then you never force young children to eat as this may cause them to choke. So I've seen children who are forced, <laughs> you know, somebody put them under their armpit and they are forcing cocoa into their mouth and all that. This may end up in a choking episode. And unfortunately, some children have died because they have aspirated some of these contents into their airways. And then you never give whole nuts to children under five. And then for the hard fruits and vegetables, you either want to boil them and cook, mash them or grate them so that they are in smaller pieces, easier for the child to be able to eat. Okay. And then the other thing is hold your baby while they drink from a bottle. So for the young, older babies, Sometimes we tend to just put the bottle in their hands and then they put it to their mouth and then they are drinking and we let them alone. So this may actually pose um, a choking hazard to the child. Now, any small objects can choke a child under three. So you make sure that young children cannot reach or play with needles, pins or safety pins, the coins, the small batteries. You ensure that all the toys have their battery compartment uh, laid screwed on tightly. Don't get let them get access to buttons. All these things pose as choking hazards to their children. And then choose age appropriate toys that are well made. So 
avoid the toys that have small parts, especially if they can be removed. They will remove them and put them in their mouths and choke on them. Don't allow your child or baby to have access to toys that are smaller than the D size battery. So these are like the small, small, I think, um, watch, um, the wrist watch batteries, um, and they can choke on them. Then when outdoors, make sure that the young children are always supervised on the uh, rope swings so that they are not strangulated. Curtains and blind cords. Young children can get caught in the dangling curtain cords, and th this can strangle them. So where possible, use the rods instead of the cords. And if you do have cords, you attach them to the wall so that they don't have access to them. You can even make them shorter so that they cannot reach them. And so this is a picture of what I'm just talking about. So you can see the cord that we use to pull the blind. Sometimes as they play their peekaboos and all that, they may get caught up with the cords around their neck. And then that may pose as a strangulation danger for them. We know about the plastics as they put them over their heads, they may suffocate from the plastics. And then the pillows and then the mattresses. We like um, putting pillows and mattresses uh, or putting pillows for example, on the beds for newborn babies and infants. But all these things have been found to pose danger to, to the babies. So uh, they do not need it. You should not use pillows for them. And, that if, and here it's said that for children under the age of two years, and babies should not be put to sleep on sofas or in adult beds together with their um, parents. Then we have the, the clothes, the hoodies that come with the strings attached. Some of the children may be playing with it before you realize they've tied it very tightly around their necks and they are choking or suffocating on them. Okay. So for choking the first age, um, it is recommended that anyone caring for children should do a first aid course and learn infant and child CPR so that you can be able to employ it in the time of an emergency. You always call for help. And here I've put in a picture of a child that they are resuscitating because the child um, has choked. So the, the, the one performing the resuscitation has put the child on her forearm and is giving some back slaps to the child in a bid to push out whatever the child has choked out, um, has choked on. So we've come to the end of our presentation. A few take home messages. I just want to say that children are not miniature adults and their curiosity and desire to explore makes them prone to injuries from accidents. In children under the age of four years, the level of motor development does not the child's cognitive cognitive and intellectual development and injuries can thus occur more easily. And we need to consider children when we are making plans for, for our homes or making changes for our home environment. And then constant supervision in the hands of a capable, dedicated adult is very necessary to prevent injuries and death from home accidents. So thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry about the internet connectivity. Oh, thank you so much, Joan. This was really, really in-depth and wonderful. I've learned so much. I was looking at some of the pictures and I was like, hey, these children will give us as heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, listening to all that, yeah, I'm sure some parents are tempted to just hold the child in their bosom <laughs> and keep them there forever. But we will also say that the child needs to explore, explore. Mm -hmm. and needs to explore to learn and mm -hmm. to grow. So how then do you balance the exploration, development and keeping them safe? I mean, parents don't have an easy job at all. But thank you Not so much telling us and showing us how we can prevent it. For me, my takeaway was that 
supervision is key. It's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And if you are not there to supervise, whoever is there to supervise has to be a sensible person who can do what you can do if you, I mean, mm -hmm. if you are not there. Okay, so we are going to take questions. I have my first question <laughs> before everybody else comes. <laughs> Madame Rouge, let me meet you. Okay, so so what about the homes where they don't? I mean, everybody is in the same, like maybe even on one bed. Mm -hmm. Um, the last part you mentioned, like the baby shouldn't sleep on the the same bed with, the, with the, the parents that that mm -hmm. happens i get that question quite a lot and i i really don't know how to answer them if they do not have i mean you can't afford a court you can't afford a, a different room you're all on the same bed or breastfeeding they are breastfeeding so much in the night you want to put the child on the bed how do you go about that one because there are some mm. families who can't afford to have the child on the same bed hmm. so that that's a very difficult um, um, um it's a very difficult situation yeah. and hmm, the risk of the sudden infant death is very real yeah so i don't know i i hmm, mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether we can prepare maybe a small area in mm. a small corner of the room should be left for maybe the baby and then the mother the mother is lying separately you know somewhere because i guess the other thing is that you are on the mattress with the baby the yeah. mattress is sort of soft and malleable and all that and then yeah. if if this baby has any burden that's you know covers his nose and you yeah. are asleep and you can't see that that baby is going to suffocate and die yeah, yeah. you know so if if you can prepare a, a small corner for the baby make sure that the 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 the, the bedding i don't know the bedding <laughs> is not <clears throat> it's a very difficult question difficult, I, I really don't know what, yeah it's a difficult yes. one i always don't yeah. know really how to yeah. answer that question i have a, i've seen quite a number of pediatricians on the call. So if any of them have, have a good answer, they should let us know. The mm -hmm. um, other point I had was the, yes, the first aid, mm -hmm. first aid. So I'm thinking that the preschoolers, or in fact, mm -hmm. all teachers then should have the knowledge of first aid, especially the crashes where we have the, the mm -hmm. toddlers. Because if a, a, a child is choking mm -hmm. in the classroom and the teacher doesn't know how to do first aid mm -hmm. that is fatal mm -hmm. so if yes. there are any um headmistresses and headmasters here and proprietors kindly make sure that all your teachers know how to do cpr but where can they learn joan any ideas where where can they learn how to do cpr hmm. for the I'm, teachers I'm I'm not too sure, but the I know the American Heart, is it the American Heart Association provides um, trainings for um, um, for healthcare personnel when it mm -hmm. comes to the basic life support and then the advanced, you know, um, yeah. yes, cardiac life support. So I, I think that if you want to pro, um, if you want to train say teachers, I don't see why they will refuse to train, to train teachers. So I think that is an, an avenue that maybe headmistresses and schools can, can, can explore to yeah. get their, their caregivers trained. Yeah, yeah, mm. okay. I will, I will personally look out for any organizations and post it on our Facebook and website so that if teachers need to do some training, they can do that. Um, okay, now let me go to the questions that people have. I've asked my questions already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so somebody said they missed the part of the kerosene. We missed the kerosene ejection part network. Um, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> we we'll have the slides, but if you can say just one or two things about the ingestion. I remember you said they shouldn't give them palm oil. Yes. Because it will make it worse. 
Yes. But they should take them straight to the hospital. Yes. And then they shouldn't put the kerosene in um, water bottles and Voltic bottles so that it doesn't mm -hmm. become attractive mm -hmm. to them. Is there yes. anything else? Ex so that's that's about it. Apart from the fact that kerosene is also a fire hazard, mm -hmm. so it can be also be a cause of you know fires which can eventually burn the child. So yeah. it, it it has two effects. It can cause burns and then it can cause the um, poisoning as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, the second question is, says that, please, what is your take on babies under one sleeping on their stomach? Hmm. Tummy time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm guessing tummy time is when they are awake. But this when one they is, are awake. Yes. But this one is sleeping. They are asleep on their stomach. It's a no, no. Okay. <laughs> it's a no, no, because they can end up you know, you see, when children are, well, infants are sleeping on their tummies, um, you can have all these things, the beddings on the, on, the, on the bed, for example, you know, covering their nostrils, they may end up just breathing the same air over and over and over again. And these have been known to um, sort of you know, put the children at risk of, you know, just breathing their own air again. And that can lead to like the sudden infant death that we are talking about. Mm. Uh, so so the, the, the sleeping on the tummy, no, it's okay. not advisable. Okay, thank you. The next question says that, please, what about babies who also die in their own court? I have a friend who left a baby in a cot whilst mm. doing her chores, only mm. for her to come and find the child dead in the cot with stains of aspirated breast milk. She mm -hmm. felt if the child was to lie on a bed, she would have seen the baby struggling through the aspiration moment. So this is the same question again mm. about um, babies yeah. in their cot or not. Mm. Mm. God help all of us. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure about if the child would have been seen. I'm not sure about that part. But if he was still doing the chores. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. But um, the, yeah. the courts I know that they are such that you should be able to see the child. I mean, a good court should be such that the child is there and you can see the child. It shouldn't be so hidden that the child is inside the court and you can't see the the child i don't know if that's that helps yes and i remember there was a time i i there, there are these small cuts you can actually put on the bed i used one where the baby is it's really small it's like um like half this my table and it's like a small cut but can be lifted and put on the bed Mm -hmm. So the mother is sleeping on the big side of the bed. Mm -hmm. The baby is also on the bed, but it's still secluded and, and cordoned off. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, that's will help. That's what I use because mm -hmm. I couldn't go back and forth taking from the pot and breastfeeding and everything. I don't yeah. know if that's, that's maybe helpful to this person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The next question, can Dr. Wood expand some more about falling off a bed, for example, and hitting their head on a hard floor? How serious is it <laughs> falling off a bed? <laughs> That's very, very serious. I mean, I mean, when you fall down, the resultant injury is, comes about from various things. So the height of the bed is important. Mm -hmm. And then the surface on which the child is landing is important. And then the part of the body that is hitting that surface is also important. Yeah. So if the bed is a low bed and he's just falling down onto a carpeted floor, he may not suffer the same degree of injury as someone who has fallen off a bank bed. Maybe yeah. he was lying on top of the bank bed and then he fell down and hit his head on a tiled floor. Mm. So the degree of injury varies depending on the height, the surface, and the part of the body. And indeed, yes, if you hit your head from that 
height onto the floor, then I'm sorry. I, that may be a very fatal injury that we may be dealing with. Okay. Mm. Thank you. So just to add to that, as Dr. Wood says, the height um, is important. Having said that, I always say that every baby will fall off the uh, lap or the bed once in a while. Mm -hmm. And God has made, has been merciful to us that usually the low regular size bed, because the babies, the very young ones, they are, their skulls are a bit soft. Yeah. Most of the time when they come to the hospital and we check them, they are okay. But definitely if your baby falls and the baby is, you know, crying incessantly or sleeping too much, or starts vomiting and everything, you need to bring the baby to the hospital for us to check mm -hmm. to make sure that the baby is fine. Somebody says that Ghana Red Cross can provide first aid training. So that's a good way for the teachers and who need first aid training. Ghana Red Cross can do that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, somebody says their four month old baby only sleeps on his stomach because any other position he would wake up the next moment. <laughs> I mean, all babies like to sleep on their stomach, but it's not safe for them. Mm. Anna Joanne. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think we've it's the same question that is coming around in yeah. different forms. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm. So it, it's not a safe position for the baby for yeah. sleeping. No. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um Somebody says we need to have training for mothers and caregivers at maternities. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mamiya, do you want to give us any comments <laughs> on um, babies sleeping on their tummy? Mamiya says her children slept on their tummy too. <laughs> <laughs> and she's my senior pediatrician. So, <laughs> um, well, I mean, there, there is, okay, Dr. Serbo. Okay, so just before we go to Dr. Serbo's comments, um, back to sleep was, um, was like a strategy. I've forgotten the, 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 the year that was started because of increase in sudden infant death syndromes. And mm -hmm. once we started back to sleep, we realized that the, 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 the numbers reduce. This can still happen, but they reduce. Um, I've read a couple of articles where um, there's no 100% correlation, but definitely um, we think that back, um, sleeping on their back, as in the supine position, is much safer. Because mm -hmm. if the child is not, um, hasn't really at attained the neck control well, where they can lift off their heads and clear their nose when they are turning. Then when they are on their, their tummies mm -hmm. and something happens, they may not be able to, you know, lift up their nose off the surface and breathe well. And yes, some babies sleep better on their tummy than at the back, but the science is telling us that back to sleep is the way to go. And um, I have advised sometimes for those babies to just put them on their side, not, totally on their tummy, but on their side and see if it will work. Those who sleep on their tummies that are also more comfortable, sometimes wrapping them or um, what is it called? You know, wrapping them really tightly may help with the sleep. So all those things are there. Swa is it swaddling? Or swaddling, blending? yes. Yeah. Swaddling them may help. Mm -hmm. Um. Dr. Sibor says, hi, use of cut bumpers is seriously discouraged now to reduce the risk of asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. Also stuffing the cut with all those large stuffed toys are not encouraged. It's also a risk. Perhaps the sleeping on the stomach issue is best for a child who can roll over mm -hmm. when they are uncomfortable. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sibor is also a seasoned pediatrician so that's her advice mm -hmm. please what is a safe position for babies to sleep i think we've answered that answered that question yes yeah so sleeping mm -hmm. on their back mm -hmm. okay all right i think that's all the hey there's a more question <laughs> okay i think this is more of a comment so i shall leave that then um 
If there are no more questions, today has been really fully, fully, fully packed. <laughs> We've had lots and lots of information. And I think some of the questions are still being, you know, discussed here and there. If you are on the parents round table, I think we can, we can continue the discussion there. And if Dr. Wood is not there, I shall put her there for some time so that she can answer some of our questions. Um, okay. If there are no pressing okay. questions, then I want to say a very big thank you, Dr. Wood, for honoring our invitation and helping us do this um, topic. I think it's been really useful. Um, we will be back next month with a very interesting topic. So please watch this space. Um, okay. I think let me read the last comments. It seems very useful. Somebody says that this thing about babies sleeping on their stomachs, I hear it all the time. I was also warned against it, but really it was the best way he slept. And he slept longest in, the, in that way. On his back or side, he only slept for a few minutes. And well, after several reprimands from my medical people, we just had to do it like that and spend countless nights with little sleep. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> okay. And then Dr. Sripo says that supervision or an adult looking in on the child is helpful when the baby sleeps best on their tummy. I'm guessing if it's the night and we are all asleep, hmm, then that will be tough. Supervision may be tough. We will hmm. continue this discussion hmm. on the on the WhatsApp page. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. Thank <laughs> it's you. been Thank great. you very much. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye bye. Bye. Um, Godfrey, somebody wants to know how they can join the page. Can you put the link ah that's the link the link is there um how do i join the page the one who asked how do i join the page the link is in the chat box how to join the whatsapp platform free so use the link please okay